Hey, you can take a seat and grab your Bibles, your Bible apps. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23 is our text. If you don't have a Bible with you and you're in the room, then grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 985 and you'll be able to find Matthew 23. Follow along with us uh, if you'd like. And as always, if you're here in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. I already mentioned we got gift cards after the service. Well, you can take a Bible every single weekend. Uh, they're always available because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Now, if you're joining us online, we are glad to have you. And if you need a Bible, please let us know. We will get you one because we want your life to be changed by God's Word as well. Hey, uh, before I dive into the message, I just got to tell you, uh, with all the stuff going on, I don't want you to miss out on this opportunity to bless others. So uh, this is a blessing that if you pay Arizona State income taxes, it, it applies to you. Uh, it's called Arizona Christian School Tax Organization, and you can, you know, direct a tax credit to bless students at Calvary Christian Academy right here in Lake Havasu City that is owned and operated by Calvary uh, that's you guys, that's us, and uh, bless the 300 students that we have there, helping them pay their tuition. The money you direct does not go to the school directly, it goes to the students directly, and we get to bless those students. And you guys are faithful, you've been blessing for years, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, that, that uh, have helped students get a Christian education. So again, if you're paying Arizona uh, you know, income tax, Please grab one of these. They're out on the, the walls. Uh, stop by the, the church office on McCulloch. Stop by the school. Uh, and the tax credit doesn't have to happen before the end of the year, but it's a good time to remind people of that. Uh, you can do that all the way up through, uh, you know, April 15th, tax time and that kind of stuff. Hey, do, can you guys believe Christmas is one week away? <laughs> Some of you are like, no, and the others of you are like, what? <laughs> what is this Christmas that you're talking about? Is anybody excited about Christmas? All right, some of you are. All right, I appreciate that. Okay, so how many have your tree up and decorated and presents under it? Okay, some of you have some work to do. Okay, who's hardcore? Who has stuff outside? Who's got lights up? Giant Frosty the Snowman or Santa Claus? Got those, you know, laser things that are like the lazy man's lights? Uh, that kind of stuff? Okay. You know, I, I love Lake Havasu because so many people put lights up, you can just drive around and it's like a, you know, Christmas light tour. How many of you guys have done the, you know, driving around looking at lights sometime? Okay, see, if some of you are like, no, we got to do it right before Christmas and it's cold enough now, you put the windows down and pretend like it's, you live someplace where it's cold and drink hot chocolate and bundle up uh, like the, the Razor group did the other night. So, uh, you know, but people just go wild with their lights. And, and I love driving at night, seeing all the lights and just going, wow, this is so cool that people are into it. But I got to be honest, sometimes I'm driving by and you see the houses that, you know, would make uh, the uh, Christmas vacation people a little bit jealous. And, uh, and I kind of have to wonder, is there as much joy on the inside as there is beauty on the outside? Uh, and it makes me realize that we face the temptation of an externally focused life. All of us, we face the temptation of an externally focused life. In other words, we are tempted to put our emphasis on appearance and how our lives look to other people. And, and, and uh, you know, because a house, think about it, a house can be decorated beautifully. It can have a, a magnificent tree that is decked out. It could have wreaths and, and, and garnish, uh, whatever it is, like stuff, I don't know what it is. It looks good. It can have stuff all over the house. It can be the lights outside, and yet the house on the inside it could be filled with, with anger and rage and selfishness and discontent and addiction and abuse. And, and that's not only true at Christmas time. Okay, let, let's just be honest about this. Our culture is obsessed with appearances, right? I mean, how many of you have social media? <laughs> it's funny, Christmas, social media. See, most of us have some kind of social media, right? And we go on there, and you look at it, and you peruse it, and you like a few things, or a lot of things, and maybe you think about it and, and not. But, but our, our, our world that we live in is obsessed with how many likes did I get? 
You know, to go viral, is, are people watching it? I mean, it's, it's like some people plan their, their lives around their posts rather than living life. Well, I didn't really want to take this trip, but I thought it looked good on Instagram. <laughs> and, 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 if you, and if you follow this stuff at all, there are people who try to go into these really cool places and put their lives at risk to get photographs that they can post on Instagram so people will like them. And yes, a lot of these social media influencers who try to do this have died trying to get the coolest photograph uh, because they want to look good, the appearances. And then it goes way beyond social media because we kind of fixate on our physical appearances, right? We work out, not so much to be healthy, but because we got to have the six-pack abs. I I'm much closer to a keg. But uh, <laughs> some of you guys share my, uh, you know, Condition and you know, but it's not just that you know the abs you got to have the bulging biceps You got to have the toned glutes and then some people are just the opposite You know, there's there's some people who because of eating disorders are dying to be thin And and then there's you know all the you know surgical augmentation that you can you know embrace Tummies breasts lips butts and then you can go on to the dental the hair the clothes the eyelashes the nails because we desperately want to look good now, some of you right now are going, you give it to them, preacher. You tell them what it's like. <laughs> you lay down the smack on all those vain people. Church world's no better. Look, those of us that are inside, those of us that are considered, you know, followers of Jesus, those of us that show up, we're, we're not, it's not just secular culture that this happens. We want to look good, too. Got to have the perfect family, the great marriage. You want the kids to look good. You want to be spiritually presentable. So, you know, you learn the church language. You know when to say hallelujah and praise the Lord and amen. We put Christian bumper stickers on our cars and post spiritually superficial posts on social media. I'm sorry, I have to say this. For the record, will you please refrain from posting if you love Jesus, share this or post this. Please, 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 please. I, it doesn't convince anybody who's not a follower to do it. And it just annoys a lot of us that are followers of Jesus. Because I love Jesus and I'm not going to share or post it. Not, not the thing that you shared and, and did that. I'm just not going to do it because Jesus never said, if you love me, post something on social media. Actually, Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. That's a whole lot harder to do than, you know, put a post online and go back to sinning. But, see, we are tempted to be externally focused. How do we look? What are the appearances? And look, we're, we're all vain enough to have looked in the mirror before we came here. We, we all did it. We wanted to make sure that we didn't look bad. So we, we live in this world where we are addressing or focusing this temptation. And, and just understand, it is not new to us. 2,000 years ago, Jesus addressed the exact same temptation in Matthew chapter 23. So I'd encourage you to look at Matthew 23. Now, this whole chapter is Jesus' rant against the religious people, specifically the religious leaders, known as Pharisees and scribes. Okay, and, and when I say rant, it is a rant. It's, it is three years of ministry frustration, and, and he is telling them what God has in store for them, how God sees them. And uh, this is the last week of Jesus' life. This is the week of his crucifixion. And the Pharisees have been trying to trap him and discredit him and, and find cause to, to, you know, kill him, all this stuff. And, and this is what he says. And he's telling them, hey, uh, you guys are hypocrites. He's rebuking them for legalism. He even calls them a brood of vipers. That's snakes, for those of you that don't read King James. And... Uh, he gets to verse 27, and I want you to listen to these two verses. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. See, the truth is we can look great on the outside and be dying on the inside. We can look great on the outside, but we're, we can be dying on the inside. You can appear to have it all together, 
and yet be rotten to the core. That, that, that's what Jesus is calling out. And, he's, and, and we need to hear this. As the people of God, we need to hear this because Jesus was addressing the leaders of the people of God. He's not addressing the people who are you know, godless and, and focused on just indulging themselves. He was talking to the most religious people of his day. So the only person that he's not talking to if you're in this room or tuning in is somebody who never goes to church and you're just here because somebody made you. This is for the rest of us. It's for me and you. You see, the, the Pharisees were respected spiritual authorities of Jesus' day. They prayed all the time. They studied scripture better than, than any of us. They kept the law, yet they were spiritually dead. Their internal life was corrupt and rotting because they were focused on the external life. Can I just confess, that was me uh, almost 20 years ago. I'd been at Calvary for, for 10 years as pastor. The church had grown tremendously, quadrupled in size, uh, and everybody was congratulating me and celebrating and telling me what a great job I was doing. I had a great family, great marriage, beautiful daughters, and... Uh, I was exhausted, I was burned out, we'd had conflict, I was tired, uh, and I'd been trying to do it all, and I was spiritually numb. I felt, I, you know, I read this and I felt like, yeah, that's me. It looks good on the outside, but inside I felt spiritually dead. So, thankfully, Calvary gave me a sabbatical, four weeks off. Now, right, uh, since that day, uh, it's been policy for every pastor on Calvary staff every five years to take some time off, sabbatical, forced, forced time off uh, away all at once. You don't get to space it out. It's just you need this time to recover because what happened to me is I reconnected with God. God helped me reorder my life. I rediscovered my passion. I started building healthy boundaries, and, and uh, God restored me to ministry and that spiritual health. But some of you know that feeling that I described. Some of you are aware of it. Your life looks good from the outside, but you know that on the inside you're withering, you're drying up, you're, you're slowly dying. I mean, maybe it's your marriage. The fire is, you know, dying out. And, and you long for the days that you would look at your spouse with excitement instead of contempt or apathy. Or maybe it's your children and you've, you just kind of lost your excitement. You used to enjoy being with your kids and now you just complain about them, yell at them, they're just a bother. Maybe it's not your kids, maybe it's your grandkids you feel that way about. Maybe it's your hobbies, maybe it's your job that just feels like a dead end. Maybe your friends, you just don't wanna be around them anymore. Maybe your desire to live is ebbing away. Life has lost its luster and its joy and you're numb emotionally, relationally, spiritually, you feel like a whitewashed tomb. You're trying to keep up appearances, but you're exhausted and weary and broken. Can I just tell you, if that is you today, if that describes your heart, your soul, how you feel about life, can I just tell you there is hope? I don't want you to hear that and go, I right, will cash it in. No, there's hope. His name is Jesus, okay? He came into this world to rescue us from our sin and from ourselves. He wants to give us life. In fact, he made the invitation in Matthew 11. He said, come to me, all you that are labored and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He wants to bless you. He wants to change your life. That's why we talk about life change all the time. But if you find yourself in that broken place, if you've been focusing on the externals, then uh, can I just invite you to admit it? Confession is where the healing begins. Just go ahead and, you know, you don't have to shout it out right now and stand up, but I mean, tell somebody. Admit it to yourself. And then ask Jesus to help you rebuild your life. Ask him to help you to build a healthy internal life. Stop pretending that you've got it all together. Stop pretending that you're better than you really are because if you're gonna defeat the temptation of an externally focused life, you gotta get, you know, you gotta ask Jesus for help and you gotta build a different life. Now, understand when I talk about building a healthy, you know, internal life, that this is a starting point. This is not comprehensive. It's not like you pray one prayer and everything's fixed. 
uh, it, it's, it's a journey. And, and if you're in a place of desperation and you need help, then please get help immediately. Talk to a counselor. Make an appointment with one of the pastors. Come pray with the prayer team uh, as a beginning point. But understand, we do not want anyone just to put another coat of paint on the tomb. We want you to experience God's life-changing power for you. And he can do that. If instead of focusing on the externals, we will say, okay, God, build a healthy internal life in me. Now, if you're going to do that, i got to share two keys to building a healthier internal life. And again, these are not just a prayer you pray. This is like decisions that you make day after day after day. This is goals that you set to strive for. It's a mindset that you ask God to, to give you so that you change how you think and how you live. Okay, the first thing. If you're going to build a healthy internal life, you've got to value character over appearances. You've got to value character. It's, it's substance over style, if you will. We all know style. We all want to be styling. I gave up on that years ago because I realized I was a hopeless dork, and if I tried to look cool, I wouldn't. So it's much easier for me than some of you. But look, everybody claims they value character. Individuals, oh yeah, we're high care, we're, we want high character friends. Hey, co companies, oh, we want to hire high character people. Sports teams, they want to, we want to draft high character players. Unless they're really talented and then we don't care. Uh, you know, and, and churches, you know, churches are like, oh yeah, we're all about character. Except, can we just be honest? Churches are notorious for judging by externals and not internals. Right? If you attend a church often enough, you dress right, you give regularly, you use church language, you smile. Oh, you're a faithful Christian because you look right. I mean, you might be mean, angry, manipulative, judgmental. You might be a pedophile. You might be an embezzler. You might be an abuser or an addict. Can't tell that just by somebody's exterior, right? Right? See, we can all be guilty of judging by appearances. All of us. And, and, and what we need to do is we need to stop focusing on the external appearances and start focusing on character. And so let me ask you a few questions. So you can, you can just evaluate you. Not the person next to you, because that's judging externals. Look at them like, I wonder if they measure up. No, look at your own life. Look in the mirror of your soul and ask God to show you. Do you, how do you measure up? to this. Okay, so just some, some questions. Is your home filled with love or conflict? Because Jesus said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Um, what's more prevalent in your household? Angry outbursts or laughter? Because honestly, if you're nice to strangers or customers and you're mean to your family, then you're living for appearances. Okay, is communication, is your communication encouraging or accusing? Are, are, are you somebody who builds up the people who are listening to you? Or are you the, you know, king or queen of critique? You know, do you, do you interrogate your spouse and your kids, you know, about what they're doing, how they're doing it, what they're, you know, Proverbs 12, 18 says, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Or how about, is forgiveness the rule of your life or the exception? Are you always holding stuff over other people? Like, remember when you did this? Are you always bringing up the past? Like somehow, you know, you're gonna, you got somebody tied up, locked up, and they owe you something because they failed you, or, or you forgave them, but you didn't really forgive them, you just are using it against them? The Apostle Paul said, look, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. If you're a child of grace, you need to be a person of grace. If you've received the grace of God, we need to be given that grace. And, and by the way, if you struggle with forgiveness, would you just, right now, just ignore me and turn over to Matthew 18 and start reading that? Uh, it'll freak you out and scare you. Um, another question, am I generous or am I selfish? It's not what you think or feel because you dropped some change in the Salvation Army kettle or, or because you dropped a few dollars in the benevolence saying, oh, I'm a generous person. No, what does your bank account really declare about you? 
You know, when you get down to right, you know, percentages, are you, are you a generous person or are you a selfish person? And if you're not sure and you think you're generous, but you're not really sure, ask the people around you. Ask the servers at the restaurants you go to. Uh, you know, hey, would you say that I'm, uh, you know, uh, just watch their face because they'll still lie to you. But, um, and here's one, just to, just to kind of check your own heart. Do you do the good deeds that you do for recognition? I mean, do you want people to see you? Do you want the, your picture in the paper? Do you want the, the accolades? Do you want the applause? Or are you just doing the stuff because you know God's watching and you don't want anybody else to know? You see, we desperately need a vibrant, growing relationship with Jesus to have the character of Christ. So are you asking God to help you become the person he created you to be? See, see, that's valuing character. When you say, God, would, would you fix me? Because you know what we usually pray. I don't know about you guys, but the temptation is this. But, but what we usually pray is something like this. God, I have a problem. Would you fix the problem? God, uh, that person's causing me. Would you fix that person? We, we literally pray for God to fix people and problems and because we think we're okay. And God's like, I'll fix the problem. The problem is you. You don't have the character of Jesus, but you want the character of Jesus? I'm gonna give it to you. Oh, by the way, once you confess Jesus as Lord, he wants to give you the character of Jesus whether you want it or not. That's why Paul says, you know, we rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope will not disappoint. It's Romans 5 if you wanna look it up. But it's a great understanding that, that we need to ask God to change us because we are the problem. And, and we gotta value character over how it looks. So a healthy internal life begins by valuing character over appearance, and then a healthy internal life lives to please God, not people. Live to please God, not people. Galatians 1.10 says, From, am I now seeking the approval of men or God? Or am I trying to live to please men? If I were trying to please men, I would no longer be a servant of God. Jesus. Isn't that amazing? The Apostle Paul says, if I want to make you happy, I'm not pleasing God. If I want to make God happy, I don't really care if you're happy or not. Now, this is challenging for those of us who are natural born people pleasers. Anyone besides me like to please people? Yeah, okay. See, I, I feel your pain. Those of you that didn't raise your hands, what is wrong with you? No, I just want to piss everyone off. I don't care. Uh, just start a fight and walk away. I don't know. It doesn't matter. No, I mean, look, you know, we want, we want people to get along. We all want to be liked and accepted and included by the people that we want to be liked, accepted, and included by. But here's the thing. You are liked, included, and accepted if you live to please God. It may not be by the people that you started off wanting to be liked, accepted, and included by. But you'll have family. You'll have friends. You'll have people around you that, that love you. So how do, we, how do we live to please God? Two, two things that are absolutely essential. First of all, you gotta be honest. You gotta be honest. Do, do you guys know that Jesus despises hypocrisy? Do you guys know that? Okay, if, here's the thing. If that statement surprises you, or even if you just need, need to read something, Matthew 23, I already read verses 27 and 28. Go back and read the whole chapter. Jesus goes off on hypocrisy. He cannot stand it, especially when it's connected to his name. So, it, you know, if we're being hypocritical at all, then, then we are displeasing God, period. End of discussion. If you want to please God, you got to be honest. You got to be honest with yourself, like, you know, who you are. My name's Chad, and I am a sinner, Okay, I fail all the time. This, this is not a, like a rare occurrence, like, oh, let's document the date. No, it's every day. Okay, I have evil thoughts because I have an evil heart and I do selfish things and, and I have to repent. I deserve to go to hell and burn there for all eternity because of my rebellion against God. But because God loves me, he sent Jesus into this world to be my savior. And because I confessed him as Lord, now, even though I deserve hell, I get to go to heaven when I die. Deal. 
Okay, now I'm included in the family of God and I, now I'm living as a servant of Christ, but I still fail. And so Jesus continues to redeem my failings every single day. And the Holy Spirit inside of me is always calling me to become more like Jesus. Okay, that's who I am. But I'm honest about that. I, I wanna be honest. I want you to be honest because we can't really please God unless we're honest. So are you being honest with yourself? Can you admit when you're wrong? Well, I can to myself. No, can you admit that you're wrong? Can you apologize easily? Can you ask people to forgive you because you failed? Hey, if you're struggling with that, you're not being honest. If you think other people are always the problem, you're not being honest with yourself. Are you honest with other people? I know, that freaks some of you out. That's why, by the way, that's why we love life groups here. A couple weeks, you're gonna have opportunity to sign up for life groups, first uh, two weekends in January. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to sign up for a life group. I want everyone to be in a life group. We don't even have enough life groups for everybody, but we'll try. And, and here's the thing. I want you in a life group because it's really easy and great to be honest with other people in a life group. It's hard to hide when there's like 10 or 12 of you in a room. So, you know, are you being honest with other people? We need encouraging godly friends that we can be honest with, people who know us and love us anyway. So we gotta be honest and we gotta be obedient. Okay, obedience is kinda like not optional because Jesus said, if you love me, you will we'll do what? Yeah, you'll obey me. You'll obey my commandments. Doesn't say you'll post on social media, you'll have bumper stickers on your car, you'll raise your hands when you worship. No, you'll obey me. It's not the externals, it's what's going on inside of you. By the way, not just the ones you like, but all of them. That's why we want you to read the Bible, because if you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit will take the Bible and hit you upside the head with it. Not physically, but he will do that. He will convict you of sin, and he will call you to repentance, and that, that's what obedience looks like. So if you're a follower of, of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, it's personal, he was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, then God the Holy Spirit is in you and God the Holy Spirit is convicting you of sin, even as I speak. I don't have to read off a list of 27 different sins because if you're like me, then the Holy Spirit is going like, hey, we've been talking about this for a while. When are you gonna get serious about it? You know I want you to repent of that. You know I want you to apologize for that. You know I want you to give grace for that. So are you obedient? Are you obedient in your relationships? You know that love is patient and love is kind. And if you're not that at your awkward family Christmas gatherings, you're not obedient. Like, but you don't know my brother-in-law. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Love is patient and love is kind. See, we, we, are, are you obedient in your relationships? Are, are you obedient in your, you know, morality? Are you being faithful to the commitments that you made, whether it's in marriage or in business or in life? Uh, are you living a, 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 you know, are you a person of integrity? Are you obedient in your habits? In other words, do your habits bless you and others or do they destroy you and others? That's why we have Celebrate Recovery Monday nights at 6.30 in this room. Because if you're struggling with your habits, we got a place for you. Uh, are you obedient in your speech? You see, are you obedient to because you want to please God or are you trying to please others? In other words, are your motives messed up? See, we want you to choose to build a healthy internal life, which means you got to value character over appearances and you got to live to please God. That's it. But you got, it means you got to do that every day. You got to wake up and say, God, today I want to please you and not other people. Today, I don't, I don't care what the other people think about my life. I want to live differently. I want to value character. And if you don't do that, you're going to be like your Christmas tree. You're like, I thought it was a Christmas message. It is a Christmas message. How many of you have an artificial tree in your house? I see those hands. So do we. Artificial tree always looks good. The needles don't fall. But an artificial tree means that the tree is what? It's fake. Right? It's not a real tree. It looks like a real tree. But is it a real tree? No, it's not a real tree. Congratulations, it's fake. Don't feel bad. 
But if you're living an externally focused life, guess what you are? Fake. You're just like your fake tree. That's right. It'll look good from a distance, but up close, everybody knows, not real. Okay, so how many of you have like a real tree? Let's see your hands. Okay, all you real tree purists, you're like, yes, we have real trees. Guess what? It's dying. <laughs> That's right, it's dying, slowly withering before your eyes. It looks alive, but it's dead. Give it long enough, all those needles will fall off on your floor. That's where we have a fake tree, right? It smells great, if you, but eventually it'll just burn like, you know, in, no sec, in two seconds. See, it's dead. It's decomposing in your house as we speak. And understand, if you're unhealthy on the inside, then you are withering spiritually just like your tree. See, I don't want you to be like any of the trees. I want you to be thriving, rooted in Jesus, growing in him, because you decide not to live an externally focused life, whether it's one approved by the world or by the church. I want you to live to please Jesus. Because Jesus came to give us life. He came to give us abundant life, eternal life. He came to give us real life. So how is your life today? I pray that it is much more than just decorated on the outside. Will you pray with me? Father, you are so, so patient with your children. I know that's because you love us and you want to bless us. And we can smile and laugh about tree analogies and, and all of that, but the truth is there's not a thing that we can hide from you. You see our hearts, you know our minds, you know our brokenness, you know our, our deceit, and yet you love us. And you call us to repentance, so we yield. I yield. I, I pray that every person in this room, every person that's tuned in would yield and that we would surrender to you once again and ask that you would help us to, to choose character over, over style. God, that, that we would live to please you and you alone and that you would make us people who represent Jesus to a world desperate to know him. We also acknowledge that we cannot do any of that without you. So let us hear and sense the voice of your Holy Spirit, as he lives in us. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.